August 2019 marks the 200th anniversary of the death of James Watt, who is best known as an improver of the steam engine and someone who made a major contribution to the Industrial Revolution and scientific enlightenment in Britain and indeed further afield. What is widely remembered in Scotland and Birmingham and indeed in many countries overseas as a key figure in the development of new technology and a man who speeded up the process of modernization around the world. My name is Dr. Malcolm Dick. I'm director of the Centre for West Midlands History at the University of Birmingham. And I'm engaged in a series of projects which involve a reinvestigation of James Watt in the year of his anniversary. Watt was a genius for many people, a great man whose importance was that he cemented Britain's significance as an engineering nation and a nation dedicated to science and technology in the 19th century. However, it's important to look at Watt in a number of different ways. And I think it becomes much more interesting if we don't put him on a pedestal and see him as a great man, but actually look at him in his context and try to explore his reputation and how his legacy has been transmitted down the years. I'm going to focus on five things which are significant ways of making sense of what and understanding and appreciating him beyond his significance as a steam engineer. First of all, Watt was the inventor of the world's first commercial copier. We have an example of one here. Watt produced two versions of this copier. One was a larger version which had a screw press and this was a portable version like a laptop. Essentially what it enabled what and other people to do was to make copies of documents using a method of transferring the ink for one piece of paper onto another piece of paper by using a roller and special inks and papers. What developed this partly as a reflection of his own interest in trying to solve uh, technical problems he wasn't the first developer of a copier. But his invention was something that was really important to him for another reason. He and his partner, Matthew Bolton, constantly feared that his workers and clerks would be able to take the ideas that he was producing, the inventions that he was making, and sell them to other industrialists for a profit. Usually clerks and draftsmen would copy diagrams and copy letters and as a result they would gain access to knowledge that what regarded as unique and specialised. The copying machine, especially the portable version, enabled him to take his machine with him on long journeys and make copies himself so that he was fully conversant with who had access to any information. He'd keep one letter for himself and send another one on to a client and not have to worry about uh, a clerk taking knowledge that the clerk shouldn't have. What also is important for other things, he developed the concept of horsepower, which was a means by which he could convey how powerful his steam engines were in a language that his clients would understand. So diagrams of steam engines would pr were produced. There were different ones that were created for different clients. Each steam engine was a unique, a, a unique version. And what could indicate how significant a steam engine would be compared to the a role of a horse 
in, in generating power. Linked with that, we remember Watt as a unit of, unit of power. Although Watt didn't invent that, the notion of Watt and wattage came later in the 19th century when scientists gave that label to um, a unit of power. There are other things that were very important. What is significant for what survives of his workshop, which has now been located in the Science Museum in London. It was originally in his house in Heathfield in Handsworth when the house was demolished in the 1920s. It was carefully packaged away, sent down to the Science Museum, and there it was reconstructed. And we can see it today when we go and visit the Science Museum and get an insight into the way that Watt worked in the last 20 years of his retirement. Watt spent a lot of his time in his workshop after he gave up a controlling role in the business. And historians are still now investigating the objects and what he left behind in the workshop to try and make sense of his final years. What was also significant in that his legacy is something that's as equal in, in importance to what he actually did in reality. His son, James Watt Jr, engaged in what we can call a filial project to promote his father's reputation in comparison with those of other industrialists and engineers and scientists. James Watt Jr managed his father's business and made a lot of money and a lot of that money was poured into creating medals, um, establishing a series of biographies, producing statues of which the first is the one in St Mary's Church, Handsworth, which has its own chapel. It's a huge statue to what it makes him look like Ramesses II, the great pharaoh of engineering, which people can come and almost worship at, what therefore becomes a secular saint. But it's also interesting to see how Watt's reputation percolated through, not just into monuments or medals or books, but into popular culture. There are a whole series of mass-produced items in the 19th and 20th century which used Watt as a vehicle for commercial or cultural purposes. So, there were commemorative ceramic plates. There were popular books for, designed for children to celebrate the role of the persistent and able genius. For example, we have a book here, The Triumph of Steam, which contains a story about James Watt and it contains images of, of James Watt as a boy composing his ideas about steam, allegedly, uh, in front of a kettle in his home. Watt appeared in adverts, he appeared in prints, and also cigarette cards and other ephemera items. This is an example of a cigarette card produced by Imperial Tobacco. The series is called Statues and Monuments, and it's got a statue of James Watt's image at Westminster Abbey, a gigantic statue, which uh, was designed to celebrate him as a great man of British culture. Also, um, to go from the sublime, I suppose, the statue to the ridiculous, we've got uh, a, rep a representation of a bubblegum wrapper from the 1960s. What was obviously seen by the company that produced the bubblegum as someone who could sell a product. And it's simply a very humble example of a number of ways in which Watt entered a wider state of mind 
in Britain, in the Western world, and indeed further afield in Japan. If we're interested in Watt, we can find out a lot about him. There are a number of books that are coming out this year. There's three, there's a major biography, there's a book on 50 objects associated with James Watt, another collection of essays by specialist academics. But there's also, at the moment, a major exhibition in the Library of Birmingham on floor three called What in the World, which uses archival sources and material culture to represent Watt's life and his significance, and also how Watt's legacy has been produced and promoted and how it has entered popular culture. I'm obviously very interested in Watt. I don't see him as a huge hero we should put on a pedestal, but someone who is clearly very significant. I'm also very interested, though, in how you see Watt, how he might be perceived as being important for Birmingham, for Britain and for the wider world. A lot has been done on Watt, a lot has been written about him, but a lot more needs to be explored. And there's a huge archive waiting for people to investigate, which has only been partially touched in the Library of Birmingham, where the exhibition is held.